Thank you once again, and um, uh, one more time to buy them, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak uh, at this conference. I'm going to today uh, uh, talk about a topic that uh, somewhat ironically um, has become more important since the um, uh, origination of the idea of what, what will I talk about and, and uh, the thought of the paper being written uh, two or three months ago. As corn prices have taken off here again, we heard yesterday about setting new, maybe uh, new record levels potentially, what we saw uh, a couple of years ago maybe isn't um, uh, something that, that will be uh, infrequent. And so, again, my, my title is, is uh, Ingredient, Nutrient, and Feed Processing Considerations in Practical Swine Nutrition. And I, I again, want to talk specifically about ingredient uh, alternatives and then two feed processing technologies that, that aren't new. They really aren't breaking new ground. But I think what we've broken is is the, the old paradigm of where, where was traditionally corn price and alternative ingredients, where is it today, and what are the maybe somewhat dated technologies that we should be taking off the shelf, dusting off, and making sure that we're applying them for uh, improved feed conversion and, and uh, diet cost uh, improvement. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, world energy rationalization and how that relates to now a, a maybe a new corn market and the reactions uh, as a nutritionist and production company to that, uh, some ingredient considerations, and then the, the feed processing opportunities. So why should we worry about uh, uh, the cost of energy? Um, I'll give you the examples here of energy-related ingredients that I would be thinking about, uh, feed fat, corn and other feed grains that, that would fit into the, uh, the formula. We talked yesterday a little bit about the ethanol byproducts, distillers, dried grains being, being one um, of, of uh, great volume now for, for use. Corn germ, bakery byproducts, maybe some um, products that are on the, the forefront of energy sparing enzymes, and then other nutrient sparing uh, feed additives. And the reason that we would want to focus, of course, so heavily on, on uh, energy is that from an energy standpoint, the cost of, of energy into the diet and the average finishing diet would be 65 to, to 70 percent of, of the diet cost. So obviously, large percentage of the, the cost of feeding a pig uh, has to do with feed, and a large percentage of that cost is due to supplying energy. So feed energy content, uh, if we put that in, in practical terms, uh, will relate to average daily gain and feed conversion, uh, feed uh, which would relate to feed milling and transport capacity, and obviously in the end, the, the target being what is our cost of production? How are we optimizing our purchase, our use, our processing, of those ingredients to, to optimize the cost of production. I want to tie corn now to what has be, become a, a fairly frequent comparison of corn to crude oil. Uh, we heard yesterday that, that we're processing now about 30% of, of the, the corn crop to ethanol, which ties it very closely then to not only the feed energy market, but, but the, the world energy and, and crude oil. So what is shown here from uh, a graph from 2004 up through current is the price of crude oil, shown in the tan line, and then the price of corn. And you can see that there are times where they become disconnected, but in, in 2008, which was really the I think the establishment of what, what maybe has this ethanol use of, of corn uh, begun to, to do to change corn prices. You can see that they were very highly uh, tied. And more recently, some, some disconnect, but they travel for the most part in, in uh, uh, good concert with each other. If we travel now to feed energy, and we think about the changes in corn price over, uh, I've gotten, uh, 
2007 through current, the, the point that I want to make with this slide is that as corn changes, all the other ingredients that would supply energy as substitutes or add energy to the diet travel with that price. And so as corn has been traveling up here over the last 30 to uh, 60 days and, and significant increases over the last few days, we, we know that with a little bit of tra trailing to those, all the other the in ingredients that you would use, again, as substitutes or energy uh, additions to the diet will travel w with corn. So our choices are uh, just uh, put our head in the sand, as we saw the picture yesterday, and assume that maybe corn price will, will come back to uh, what we remember it being in the past, use high-priced feed grains, or feed grains with cost-effective substitutes, and as I'll, I'll talk here in a minute, uh, some processing technologies that provide advantages to uh, mitigating some of the cost increase uh, w with those increased uh, feeding costs. I want to use this slide to um, talk a little bit about uh, the, the options that are, have become available over the last three to four years with the, the biorefining uh, process and corn and in a lot of cases is ground and goes right into fermentation for, for ethanol. In some plants though it is fractionated into the germ fraction and uh, have the bran fraction and then the endosperm that ends up going into um, the fermentation. In the end what we have is a uh, either a germ to use, high corn oil um, uh, quality ingredient um, uh, we have the brand to use or, or in the case of, of the endosperm going directly into fermentation, a high protein uh, distillers or a combination of these that would give us a distiller's dried grains. We, we've talked a little bit about yesterday mycotoxins and, and how the um, challenge of uh, concentrated uh, mycotoxins can uh, be derived from distillers dried grains if we have contaminated corn going into fermentation. That's one of the aspects that it's really important to watch uh, with distillers and some of these byproducts. Another one would be just the quality and the variation from, from plant to plant that is processing uh, distillers dried grains. I want to show uh, here a just a relative comparison of, of 27 different suppliers as a method to differentiate companies or, or processing types for um, lysine and amino acid digestibility. And what you can see is that there, there's a large variation across uh, supplier um, in that uh, lysine digestibility estimate. And I'll point out to you that the, the very top threshold of these, these plants comes from one primary supplier, multiple plants, but an indication that their process is different than, than a lot of, of, of the other uh, suppliers. So a very important point to make sure that you have some control or understanding of what is the amino acid uh, digestibility difference uh, of this particular byproduct. Micron size also varies uh, across the distillers, and, and that'll become maybe more evident in a few minutes as to why I would worry about that. But uh, again, large variation in, in the micron size of, of the distillers itself. We um, had an experience within our, our uh, research facilities, which we're, we were studying a, a, a source difference of, of distillers that I just show through one slide here, in which we had a source, uh, source one and source two of, of a distiller's dried grains formulating to the nutrient content that we understood it had. And then we began to feed pigs that were uh, at an average starting weight of about 37 kilos fed them for uh, 16 days, and you can see the difference in the, that source, which ended up being an amino acid digestibility difference between those sources, created uh, nearly a kilo of weight difference at the end of only a 16-day feeding period. And this, this just points out that um, point that I'm trying to make, that 
distillers are variable and it's uh, extremely important that an understanding of, of that particular byproduct uh, be understood. And I'll use distillers as my only example to say all of these byproducts that benchmark their price to corn are variable. Bakery byproduct, feed fats, uh, different types, uh, the, the, the clear understanding of, of their variation is, is important. So from an alternative ingredient focus, um, uh, we would aggressively seek out and evaluate uh, new alternative ingredients and maximum use uh, constraints and uh, develop a thorough understanding of, of the ingredient source variability through R&D activities, utilizing available laboratory uh, resources, and then, of course, adjusting the formulation matrix. I want to talk now to, about some feed processing opportunities, and I'll show again some data that will date back to the, the early 90s, so not really new, but I think worth taking off the shelf and dusting off in the, in the new environment that we're in, in today. First of all, I want to talk about the grind size, and I'll talk about corn micron size, but this really fits for any feed grain and, and maybe translates even into soybean meal and, and other ingredients. Uh, I've got four pictures here, one that's 369 microns, one 575 microns, one 851, and the other 1400. And I think this range of these three would be uh, 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 ranges uh, within corn micron grinding that you would find if you were pelleting feed and, and find some many much lower than that, up to um, a micron size that I think would be fairly standard in, in uh, a coarse grinding. This obviously would be way out of the bounds of, of anything that we would hope uh, would be fed to, to pigs. The impact of the fine grinding, this being uh, shown through Wondra, the uh, Kansas State study, uh, was reported back in 92, uh, varying from 1,000, 800, 600, and 400 microns, and shows that dry matter, energy, and nitrogen digestibility is improved when, uh, as corn is, is ground finer. Uh, I would also point out a study that uh, we were involved with that the University of Illinois conducted uh, back in 2008, which we compared uh, 315 micron corn and 600 micron corn, which again shows about a 5% difference in metabolizable energy value for the corn that is, is ground finer. Now getting, translating that now into, well it's nice to grind uh, corn fine, what does that mean from a cost standpoint? I've, I've put together a table where we have corn price at $3 per bushel or $6 per bushel just to show the contrast of the value of fine grinding as corn becomes more expensive. And at uh, different micron sizes of 400, 600, or 800, and I've held the diet uh, isochloric with the fat cost being the, the same relative to corn. So you can see if we just use the 400 and the 800 micron comparison, uh, we've got about $11 a ton difference in cost of that diet just because of the processing of, of uh, the, the, the corn. That grows then from that $11 difference to uh, about $21 difference if you have more expensive corn more expensive corn, the energy value of that corn is worth more, and finer grinding, it, again, would have greater value. So how does that relate to the cost of feeding a pig? Um, if we were pelleting feed and able to grind at 400 microns, as compared to maybe using a hammer mill and, and mash feed, that would relate to about $3.30 difference in feeding cost uh, due to grinding uh, differences. Another K-State study that I'll, I'll uh, show um, included some evaluation of pellet durability, which is another topic that I'll talk about here in a minute, um, with varying micron size from 1,000 down to 400. And you can see that 
that pellet durability is improved as um, micron size is decreased, which is a good thing. Um, and then some comparisons here uh, on milling energy and the milling cost per ton. There's often the, the argument of, well, you get that value from, from the uh, finer grinding of corn, but doesn't it cost uh, much more to grind it, grind it finer? And yes, it does, but it, it is uh, the value relative to the cost is, is really no comparison. In a Murphy-Brown study that, that we did to confirm some of those results, we, we ground corn at 380, 600, and, and 800 microns, and this showing the, the kilowatt hours per ton of energy used. Uh, so you can see, yes, it does cost more energy to grind finer, and relating that then at a 8 cent per kilowatt hour to cost per ton, yes, it's going to be a more costly, let's say 50 cents uh, uh, per ton of cost to, to uh, grind finer. Uh, but as I related earlier, we have a five to six dollar a ton advantage in, in the, the uh, value of the diet. So 50 cents to grind it finer, five dollar advantage, uh, uh, well worth the, the cost of that added grinding. So reduced micron size provides Im improved digestibility and increased energy availability, far outweighs the cost of fine grinding, and optimization must be done uh, considering the, the potential for uh, gastric ulcers, which I'll just quickly relate that to. I think it has a heavy uh, health-related and, and uh, genetic base-related um, uh, consideration. Pellet quality or, or pellet defines. Um, three pictures here again 20% pellet, 80% fines, 60% pellets, 40% fines, and then one that would be a what I would qualify as a high quality pellet if we can deliver that to the pig at the feeder. So, what does that mean? Or, first of all, what uh, are some of the impacts within the, the feed milling that would, would uh, assist in pellet durability or impact it? feed formulation, cooling the pellet, dye specifications, conditioning of the mash, uh, and particle size, as we've d discussed. Again, back to a Kansas State study where screened pellets, uh, so very 100% uh, pellets being delivered to, to the pig, 80% pellets, 60 and 40%, and you can see a deterioration of, of feed conversion as, as the uh, pellet percentage decreases. We conducted a study uh, very similar to that one back in 2003 to validate those responses in our system and found that, again, 90% pellets traveling to a 30% pellet, 70% fines a deterioration in feed conversion that has an opportunity of $2.60 per head advantage if you're here in pellet quality and you can move in, in the direction of delivering a higher quality pellet or more pellets to, to the feeder. Just want to use this as an example of the way that we monitor um, uh, pellet quality coming out of, out of our feed mills. This, uh, uh, process control chart of which these these dates here would would go back to the time prior to an adjustment at this particular feed mill um, and then changes being made and the increase in in pellet quality these being 70 80 90 and and 100 percent pellets through our measure so a nice improvement in pellet quality some consistency and then most recently uh, due to a number of factors, but uh, uh, changing corn quality, changing corn moistures, a number of things we've, we've seen some tailing off. But we monitor this very uh, closely on feed coming out of our mills. So areas of consideration, uh, I would say reduced particle size is a, a nice opportunity for improvement in, in pellet quality, dye specifications, mash feed conditioning, binding agents are a potential if they are cost justified, uh, post pelleting and handling of feed, your transport out to the farm uh, within the feed mill, and then certainly formulation can have an impact on, on uh, that final pellet. 
So in summary, uh, I would say uh, world energy demand uh, is certainly um, uh, caused an impact on our cost for production. Uh, it will continue to be an impact uh, and, and uh, specific measures that we may be able to make through feed processing or, or diet formulation ingredient uh, substitution will be important. Grain micron size is a critical factor and again an opportunity for getting more out of the corn or the grain that you are purchasing uh, and improving that final cost of production. And then pelleting also as a feed processing technology that can provide through processing a very cost-effective improvement in, in cost of production. So with that, I, I'll uh, take any questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention.